We're going to look at Romans chapter 9 and go verse by verse. And we're going to look at the advantages of the Jews. We're going to look at the three seeds. And we're going to look at how both Jews and Gentiles are in the body of Christ. But first let's look at the advantages of the Jew. The Jews had some great advantages when it came to being right with the Lord. That is what we're going to look at first in this chapter. And number one, they had a burdened preacher praying for them. In Romans 9.1, it says, I say the truth in Christ, I lie not, my conscience also bearing me witness in the Holy Ghost. So this is the Apostle Paul talking, and he says, the truth in Christ. So he says the truth in Christ, and in Colossians 3.9, Paul says, lie not one to another. So Paul is just practicing what he preaches. And he is about as far from a false teacher or a deceiver as you can get. So he speaks the truth in Christ and lies not. His conscience bears him witness in the Holy Ghost. And the conscience of a saved person is heightened by the Holy Ghost. A lost man's conscience may make him feel bad for telling a lie, but Paul has the Holy Ghost, which would make him feel even worse if he deceived others. So he says the truth in Christ and lies not. But the greatest lie detector in existence, the Holy Ghost, can confirm this. And the Bible talks about, Cursed be he who doeth the Lord's work deceitfully. If you have a true burden, when you do the work of the Lord, you're not going to do it deceitfully. You're going to do everything in truth. You're going to uh, read the scriptures in truth. You're not going to try to take the scriptures out of context. You're not going to try to uh, lead someone the wrong way to get them to believe the gospel. You're going to do everything in truth, just like Paul does. Paul says in Romans 9, 2, that I have great heaviness and continual sorrow in my heart. And this is a paradox in the Christian life. Paul is always happy and rejoicing. He knows he's a winner either way. However, on the other hand, he has a burden. The Jews had preachers and prophets with burdens for, for, for them throughout the Bible. And this is an advantage of the Jew. Paul has great heaviness and continual sorrow in his heart for the Jews. And if you've ever met a real preacher or real soul-winning Christian you'll notice that they have a burden and they'll shed tears for people. But also, when you're around them, you can see the joy. You see the joy and you see the sorrow. And these, these two things are both in the Christian life. We're joyful and sorrowful at the same time. We know we're on our way to heaven, yet we know there's people back here that need us. And the Bible says... Paul says, I have a desire to depart and to be with Christ, which is far better. But he knows it's more needful for people if he stays so he can win them to the Lord. But Paul was happy in the Lord, but he had a heavy heart and he kept a burden. And according to Solomon, Paul was a wise man because Ecclesiastes 7, 4, it says the heart of the wise is in the house of mourning and the heart of fools is in the house of mirth. So Paul kept a burden. He wasn't living in pleasure. He was uh, living with the burden and keeping lost people on his heart. And in these last days, it's a selfie generation, as my pastor Donnie Dalton always says. But this is because people don't have a burden for others. They just have a burden for their own needs and their own wants. And many people have more of a burden for uh, who will be voted off American Idol than they do about the souls of men. They have more of a burden about their favorite TV show or their favorite football team than they do about people going to hell. But Paul wasn't this way. Because in Romans 9.3, in the chapter we're studying, he says, For I could wish that myself were a curse from Christ for my brethren, my kinsmen according to the flesh. And if these lost Jews couldn't be saved, if it was impossible for these lost Jews to be saved, then Paul's burden was in vain. He would be saying this statement in vain. It would be foolish for Paul to wish himself a curse from Christ for his kinsmen according to the flesh if God had already elected them to be damned. 
Uh, that would make no sense. Uh, as long as there is breath in their lungs, there's hope for them. And Paul knew this because God is a whosoever God. Uh, Paul would have literally went to hell for his kinsmen according to the flesh. He would have went to uh, a hell way worse than any horror movie like Drag Me to Hell or Constantine or any other Hollywood uh, movie could depict. Uh, he would have went to hell and back if this meant he could get those people converted. Uh, Paul is the apostle to the Gentiles. However, he still witnesses to Jews and has a heavy burden for the Jews because they are his kinsmen according to the flesh. And when we are born again, we are neither Jew nor Greek, as Paul says in Galatians, but physically you still are whatever you are. And these were Paul's kinsmen according to the flesh because he was a Jew physically. But in Christ he was neither Jew nor Greek, but he had a burden for his people, his kinsmen according to the flesh. And when you get saved, you need a burden for your people, your family, and, and you need to try to get them saved. The first thing you need to do after you get saved is give your relatives the gospel. Give your family the gospel. But the first advantage of the Jew was that they had a preacher with a burden. And they had preachers and prophets throughout the Bible that had a burden for them, was trying to turn them back to God. And most likely in your life, you've had a preacher or somebody that's tried to get you to God. America has had preachers with burdens. We have been preached to death, yet men still don't want anything to do with God. Remember all the great preachers from days gone by. And if you don't know these names, I'd suggest looking them up and finding out who they are, maybe listening to their preaching, if it's still around. Some of them, it'd be hard to find their preaching because they're so old, but America's had great preachers that's had a burden for them, just like Paul had for the for the Jews, but some great preachers from days gone by as men like J. Frank Norris, Billy Sunday, Mays Jackson, Billy Kelly, Ralph Sexton Sr., uh, J. Harold Smith, Adrian Rogers, Harold Seitler, Sammy Allen, Larry Winkler, Peter Ruckman, Clarence Larkin, Schofield, Danny Castle, Donnie Dalton, Percy Ray, Ed Maccabee, James Modlish, David Peacock, and the list goes on. And there are even younger men today with burdens. And still, most people don't get right. And they're just stepping over. Preachers today like Gene Kim, C.T. Townsend, Brent Carr, Andrew Schluter, Robert Breaker, David J. Stewart. Just great preachers who are King James Bible believers putting out the gospel. And you have men stepping over these men just like they did the preachers from days gone by but if we have that advantage and and we we always have that advantage this makes us worse than Sodom and Gomorrah if we reject the savior because they didn't have the light we've got they didn't have the scriptures we have they didn't have the kind of preachers we have but the Jews they had a preacher with a burden now let's look at what other advantages did the Jew have. They had the adoption. In Romans 9, 4 through 5, it says, Who are Israelites, to whom pertaineth the adoption. So Israel was adopted as the Lord's firstborn son. And this has to do with a nation, not an individual. In the New Testament, the individual saint is adopted. But here this refers to the nation of Israel as a nation. Uh, Exodus 4.22 says, And thou shalt say unto Pharaoh, Thus saith the Lord, Israel is my son, even my firstborn. So they had the adoption. And now what an advantage that was. Israel as a nation was in God's family. Israel, as a, Israel was even married to the father. And throughout America's time, many people have had a privilege and this privilege is being born into a Christian home or being married to a Christian woman who prayed them into the family of God so just like Israel was a part of God's family a lot of people in America who are lost were born into families who tried to get them to God 
And this is an advantage of America. And there are people around the world born into Muslim families where they are deceived the moment they can understand their parents. And this is a disadvantage. But if you were born in America, especially in the South, it's a good chance that you at least had a grandmother who was a Christian and exposed to you the gospel, took you to church, maybe even listened to gospel music in the car to and from church. And it's a good chance you heard a Bible preacher somewhere, sometime in your life. And those are advantages. Just like the Jews had the advantage of being God's firstborn. So Israel had the advantage of a preacher with a burden. They had the advantage of the adoption, and they also had the advantage of seeing God's glory. Romans 9, 4, who are Israelites to whom pertaineth the adoption and the glory. The Israelites saw the glory of the Lord firsthand. They saw him in a pillar of a cloud by day and in a pillar of fire. Uh, Exodus nineteen eleven says, and be ready against the third day. For the third day the Lord will come down in the sight of all the people up on Mount Sinai. So they saw the Lord the same way that the Jews saw God's glory and miracles and mighty works. Many people in America throughout history have seen God's glory. Just like Israel saw God's glory, people in America in a sense have seen God's glory in preaching meetings and seeing people get miraculously healed through prayer. And this is an advantage. Many believe the reason churches are going to the contemporary stuff is because they've never been exposed to the real power of God coming down and seeing God's work and glory in their life. But what is another advantage that Israel had? They had the covenants. Romans 9, 4, who are Israelites, to whom pertaineth the adoption and the glory and the covenants. So God made covenants with Israel. He made the Abrahamic covenant. He made the Mosaic covenant, the Davidic covenant. All of these agreements he made with Israel. And they also had the giving of the law. Romans 9, 4, who are Israelites, to whom pertaineth the adoption and the glory and the covenants and the giving of the law. The law came by Moses, a Jew. He gave the Jews the, God gave the Jews the oracles of God. Paul calls that an advantage in Romans 2. Uh, and the oracles of God are his words, the word of God, the, because the Bible was written by Jews. Uh, God used Jews to pin down the word of God. And in a, in a way, uh, God's blessed America in this way. While he gave Jews the oracles of God, he's let us have the word of God without fear and just having freedom to read it. The Lord has blessed America by letting us have access to the Bible 24-7 every day of the year. I have the Bible with me everywhere I go. This is a huge advantage for Americans. What about the service of God? That's another advantage for the Jew in Romans 9-4. And this service had this has to do with the service in the tabernacle and the temple. Hebrews 9, 6, And when these things were thus ordained, the priests went always into the first tabernacle, accomplishing the service of God. And while we don't go in tabernacles and temples today, you have local churches spread out, especially in the south, spread out everywhere. Bible-believing churches where that men drive by every day on their way home, on the way to work. That is a a light that's a that's a roadblock on your way to hell and that's an advantage because uh, there's places you can go and there won't be any bible believing churches but many christians throughout time in america have went to bible believing churches and did the service of god and next the promises the Another advantage of the Jews, the promises. The Lord promised Abraham, saying, I will bless them that bless thee, and curse them that curseth thee. So they had that. And another advantage was Christ came as a descendant of the Jews. Jesus Christ was a descendant of Abraham, the first Jew. 
Uh, the Lord came to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. He came unto his own, and his own received him not. And sadly, most Jews are going to hell today because they reject the Messiah. And the Jews had all of these advantages, yet most of them today are lost and on their way to hell because they rejected Jesus Christ. They are blind in part to this day. And something I want you to notice is that Abraham has three seeds. You see, Abraham had a baby named Hagar. No, he had a baby by Hagar, uh, and they named him Ishmael. And this was out of the will of God, yet the Lord blessed him anyway and made Ishmael and his seed a great nation. But uh, Ishmael was rejected by God as the seed. And his, uh, his Ishmael and his people are bad people. And his, his seed to this day is bad. And the Lord saw that through his foreknowledge. Uh, then Abraham had a baby by Sarah in their old age. And they called him Isaac. And this was the child of promise. This was the child that God had promised to Abraham that would bring about this seed. Uh, he was the Lord, the one the Lord promised. And then you have the spiritual seed. So you have Ishmael, you have Isaac, and you have the spiritual seed. And the moment a Jew or Gentile believes on the Lord Jesus Christ, we become the spiritual seed of Abraham. And even physical Jews who descended from Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and the promised seed must believe the gospel to be a part of the spiritual seed or they'll go to hell. So you have the three seeds. You have Abraham's rejected sons, such as Ishmael and Esau, which was Jacob's son. And then you have the children of promise, such as Isaac and Jacob. And then you have the spiritual seed, which is all born-again believers. And even the real descendants, the children of promise, the, you know, Isaac and Jacob, their descendants have to believe the gospel to become a part of the spiritual seed. And if they don't, they're going to hell just like anybody else. Uh, Romans 9, 6 says, Not as though the word of God hath taken none effect, for they are not all Israel, which are of Israel. And the ones who aren't all Israel are the ones who reject the Lord Jesus Christ, including descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. If they don't believe the gospel, then they're lost and going to hell. But the descendants of Ishmael and Esau also are in Israel. The Lord rejected them. And if to be a part of that remnant, that remnant that's going to be saved when, when the Lord Jesus Christ comes back, that remnant of Jews. See, there's going to be a remnant of Jews that are, are going to be saved when the Lord Jesus Christ comes back at His second coming. And they have to be of the promised seed. They had to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ or they're not going to go into the kingdom. They're not going to get the promises. Now, the descendants of Ishmael and Esau, if they believe the gospel they can also become a part of the spiritual seed but just because so just because they're they're the rejected sons doesn't mean they can't get in through the Lord Jesus Christ but those people of that seed is not going to inherit the promises they're not going to get the land and just because you're a Jew doesn't mean anything just because you are a real descendant of Abraham Isaac and Jacob does not mean you're going to get anything if you reject the Lord Jesus Christ. So you have the three seeds. You have the children of promise, the rejected sons, and you have the spiritual seed. And Romans 9, 7 says, Neither because they are the seed of Abraham are they all children, but in Isaac shall thy seed be called. So just because Ishmael was the seed of Abraham, it doesn't mean he's accepted. He was rejected and cast away. The promised seed was Isaac. That's who's going to get the promises. Romans 9, 8, 9, 8 says, That is, they which are the children of the flesh, these are not the children of God, but the children of the promise are counted for the seed. And Isaac was the of the children of promise. Romans 9, 9, For this is the word of promise. At this time will I come, and Sarah shall have a son, which was Isaac. And now let's, let's look at what's called the election of two nations. Abraham beget Isaac, and Isaac beget Jacob and Esau. Jacob was of the children of promise, 
and carried on the promised seed because Esau sold his birthright to Jacob. And a great nation also came from Esau. The, and a, a great n nation, as you know, of course, comes from Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Uh, Romans 9.10 says, And not only this, but when Rebekah also had conceived by one, even by our father Isaac, for the children being not yet born, neither having done any good or evil, that the purpose of God according to election might stand, not of works, but of him that calleth. Now notice that this election spoken of in the in the verse is not about salvation. It's about the sup superiority of a nation. Because Jacob was going to be greater than Esau. The Lord made his decision of choosing Jacob and Israel instead of choosing Esau and Edom. Because he saw through his foreknowledge that Esau would sell his birthright. And we can see exactly what this is talking about if we just look at Genesis 25 and verse 23. It says, And the Lord said unto her, Two nations are in thy womb, and two manner of people shall be separated from thy bowels. And the one people shall be stronger than the other people, and the elder shall serve the younger. Talking about Esau serving Jacob. Notice it says, The elder shall serve the younger. It said, Two nations were in Rebekah's womb. This shows that Romans 9 is talking about the election of a chosen people, a chosen nation. It's not talking about being elected to salvation, as many Calvinists may teach. And Romans 9, 12 through 13 says, And it was said unto her, The elder shall serve the younger. As it is written, Jacob have I loved, but Esau have I hated. See how Romans 9 matches the prophecy given in Genesis twenty five twenty three. Because it says the elders shall serve the younger. Showing it's referring to God choosing a nation. Election of a nation. Uh, not individual salvation. And he said Jacob have I loved but Esau have I hated. Esau isn't part of the promised seed. He rejected. Part of that rejected. Uh, Romans 9.14 says what shall we say then? Is there unrighteousness with God? God forbid. Uh, is there is, So is there unrighteousness with God? Of course there's not. Esau rejected his birthright of his own free will. God didn't make him. Uh, he chose to have some pottage over being in the line of Christ. He chose that of his own free will. God didn't make him do this. But God knew that he would do it, and that is what he based his decision off of when he chose Jacob and Israel instead of Esau and Edom. Romans 9.15 says, For he saith to Moses, I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy, and I will have compassion on whom I will have compassion. And this doesn't mean that God was sitting up in heaven and just decided he would show mercy to some for no reason. Because he always knows through his foreknowledge the entire life of the person and what their decision is going to be. Just like with salvation, the Lord's mercy is based on our decision regarding the Lord Jesus Christ. If you choose Jesus Christ, you get mercy and compassion. And God sees through his foreknowledge who will choose Christ, so he knows who's going to get mercy and compassion. It's his will to give mercy and compassion to anybody who gets in the Lord Jesus Christ. It's not that he's choosing, just randomly choosing, I'm going to show mercy on him, I'm going to show compassion on him. It's not like that. Romans nine sixteen and 17. So then it is not of him that willeth, nor of him that runneth, but of God that showeth mercy. For the scripture saith unto Pharaoh, Even for this same purpose have I raised thee up, that I might show my power in thee, and that my name might be declared throughout all the earth. So the Lord didn't just harden Pharaoh's heart unrighteously. The Lord saw into the future, and he knew he would reject the words of Moses. And the Lord even lets Pharaoh, Pharaoh reject Moses two times before he hardens his heart. Notice how the Lord already knew from the get-go that Pharaoh would not let the children of Israel go. Because in Exodus 3.19 it says, And I am sure that the king of Egypt will not let you go. No, not by a mighty hand. So Pharaoh had his free will to choose. And if he would have chose the Lord and listened to Moses, his heart would never have been hardened, but he didn't. So the Lord used Pharaoh to reveal his wrath and his power. 
Romans 9.18 says, Therefore he ha hath he mercy on whom he will have mercy, and on whom he will he hardeneth. It's his will to show mercy to everyone who gets in Christ. It's his it's his will to show every show wrath to everyone who doesn't get in Jesus Christ. So he has mercy on those who do what he says on how to get mercy. He's not choosing at random. Romans 9.19 Thou wilt say then unto me, Why doth he yet find fault? For who hath resisted his will? And many resist his will. The Bible talks about those who resist his will. In Acts 7.51 it says, Ye stiff-necked and uncircumcised in heart and ears, ye do always resist the Holy Ghost as your fathers did, so do ye. And even today, people hear a gospel message and resist. Uh, God's will is that everyone will be saved, but they resist His will, and they they stay lost, and they'll go to hell. Romans nine twenty says, "Nay, but O man, who art thou that replies against God? Shall the same, shall the thing formed say to him that formed it, Why hast thou made me thus? So God formed man; He made the brain of man. So He is obviously smarter than man. Do I have any right to question God or what He says and does? No way." And some sinners say, well, God made me this way. Or some sinners say, why did God make me this way? We have no right to question God. But now let's look at vessels of honor and mercy compared to vessels of dishonor and wrath. Romans 9.21 says, Hath not the potter power over the clay of the same lump to make one vessel unto honor and another unto dishonor? The Lord is the potter, and you are the clay. The fact that you are a vessel of dishonor doesn't mean you can't change to a vessel of honor. You can change this of your own free will. Second Timothy 2.20-21 through 21 says, But in a great house there are not only vessels of gold and of silver, but also of wood and of earth, and some to honor and some to dishonor. Now watch this. If a man therefore purge himself from these, he shall be a vessel unto honor, sanctified and meet for the master's use, and prepared unto every good work. Notice it says, If a man therefore purge himself from these, he shall be a vessel unto honor. You can change it of your own free will. Romans 9.22 says, What if God, willing to show his wrath and to make his power known, endured with much long suffering the vessels of wrath fitted to destruction? You don't have to be a vessel of wrath. You can be saved. Romans 9.23 And that he might make known the riches of his glory on the vessels of mercy, which he had afore prepared unto glory. Every lost man is a vessel of wrath. John 3.36 says, He that believeth on the Son hath life, and he that believeth not the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abideth on him. And every saved person is a vessel of mercy. You don't have to stay a vessel of wrath. Who's going to meet destruction? Uh, God's long suffering and is giving you a chance to become a vessel of mercy. But next, I want to talk about both saved Jews and Gentiles are in the body of Christ. Romans nine twenty four and twenty five says, "Even us whom He hath called, not of the Jews only, but also of the Gentiles." As He saith also in Hosea, Hosea, I will call them My people which were not my people, and her beloved, which was not beloved. The Gentiles weren't God's people. However, we become sons of God when we believe on Him for salvation. We get into the family of God through the Lord Jesus Christ. And those verses also have future applica application to the Jewish remnant who will believe on the Lord Jesus Christ after the rapture. And they will not be a part of the body of Christ, but they will be a remnant of Jews that will go into the kingdom and enter into the, to the land promised to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Romans 9.26 says, And it shall come to pass that in the place where it was said unto them, Ye are not my people. There shall they be called the children of the living God. Hosea 1.10 says, Yet the number of the children of Israel shall be as the sand of the sea, which cannot be measured nor numbered, and it shall come to pass that in the place where it is said unto them, Ye are not my people, there it shall be said unto them, Ye are the sons of the living God. The Jews 
who are of the promised seed and who have believed Jesus Christ as their Messiah will, will go to reign with the Lord Jesus Christ in the millennium. And we will also be there in that kingdom with Him. And our reigning with Him is based on our suffering with Him that we do here in this life. If we suffer with Him, we shall also reign with Him. Romans 9.27 Isaiah also crieth concerning Israel, Though the number of the children of Israel be as the sand of the sea, a remnant shall be saved. And the fact that Paul said that Isaiah also crieth concerning Israel seems to imply that the past couple of verses were also primarily referring to Israel. Romans 9.28 For he will finish the work and cut it short in righteousness because a short work will the Lord make upon the earth. A short work could be referring to the time of Jacob's trouble. In that time the devil knows he hath but a short time as it says in Revelation 12.12. 12. Romans 9.29 And Isaiah said before, Except the Lord of Sabaoth had left us a seed, we had been as Sodoma and been made like unto Gomorrah. And Sodom and Gomorrah were destroyed. And if the Lord hadn't left them a seed, if the Lord has does it, hadn't left the Jews a seed, they would have had the same future if they didn't have a remnant. Romans 9.30 What shall we say then that the Gentiles which followed not after righteousness have attained to righteousness, even the righteousness which is of faith. The Gentiles didn't follow the law. They were uncircumcised, and yet they attained to the righteousness which is of faith. Romans 9.31 But Israel, which followed after the law of righteousness, hath not attained to the law of righteousness. So Israel followed the law. They were circumcised. They had all the advantages, yet they rejected the Lord, and hath not attained to the law of righteousness. Romans 9.32, Wherefore, because they sought it not by faith, but as it were by the works of the law, for they stumbled at that stumbling stone. So they tried to get to heaven through their own goodness, and you can't do it. It's not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy, he saved us by the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Ghost. So they're ignorant of God's righteousness and go about to establish their own righteousness. Romans 9.33 says, And as it is written, Behold, I lay in Zion a stumbling stone and rock of offense, and whosoever believeth on him shall not be ashamed. The rock of offense is none other than the Lord Jesus Christ. In Matthew 16.18 he said, Upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevent, prevail against it. Uh, Jesus is the rock, not Peter. The church is built on the rock, the Lord Jesus Christ. 1 Peter 2.8 calls him a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense. Uh, Moses smote the rock and water came out for the children of Israel. This picture is how the Lord Jesus Christ is the rock and out of him comes living water. Moses was supposed to speak to the rock. Instead, he smote the rock. And this picture is how the Jews rejected Jesus Christ and crucified their Messiah. Deuteronomy 32, 30 through 31 says, How should one chase a thousand, and two put ten thousand to flight, except the rock had sold them, and the Lord had shut them up? For the rock is not as our rock. Their rock is not as our rock, even our enemies themselves being judges. So our rock, the Lord Jesus Christ, is greater than anything. Even the rock in your iTunes or Pandora radio. Uh, the rock of this world is not the rock that we have, the Lord Jesus Christ. But this has been verse by verse of Romans chapter 9.